Welcome to Discerning the Forms. I'm Nick. I'm Anthony. And we changed our logo a little bit. Yeah. A little darker, a little more mysterious. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, You know, we're not pros at this, but we we do what we can. Yeah. I think the... As long as we're p- pumping out the episodes consistently, because yeah. you know the po- podcasts die every day because they don't, you know, and so here we are again, again, alive. keep keeping it alive. However many people are listening, we are genuinely appreciative yes, of absolutely. anybody engaging it. It's really cool. Um, Love you guys. So, uh, <laughs> if there are any gals listening, that's cool. <laughs> Not so, we're trying to be overly masculine or whatever but you know yeah all are welcome (laughs) (laughs) okay let's move um, on (laughs) yeah well we're talking about (laughs) metaphysics tonight we um tonight today whatever it is for you and uh it's a big topic and it's not metaphysics like barnes and noble metaphysics are there still (laughs) barnes and nobles i don't know there's one, yeah, uh, where my parents used to live, uh, where I used to, there's the, at a, there's a mall where there, there's a big Barnes and Noble, so, which okay. there are some, but not, I don't think many. And I don't go in there to buy books anymore. <laughs> it's the last place yeah. I'll go to get books. They never have oh, anything man, of interest to me, ever. Yeah. I did buy a, a Nietzsche book at a Barnes and Noble once. Oh, you know what? I did. Now that you're right, now that I'm thinking about it, I did buy. Uh, do you know the author Gene Wolfe? He's a yeah, science fiction yeah. author. I found a copy of The Wizard Knight, which is like a, a two. I found that one. I found a really cool one that had kind of a. Uh, it was like the inside one of the pages was messed up, so it was like a printing error thing. So I got oh, a discount yeah. on it. So I was like, "Yeah, I'll buy this. Yeah, give me that. I'll, I'll definitely buy the." So I have that. I did. That was the last book I bought from Barnes and Noble, which is a respectable, I think, purchase of all purchases I can. And Nietzsche is also a respectable purchase yeah. from Barnes and Noble. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so metaphysics is not study of the occult necessarily, and spooks. <laughs> oh, I see. What, I see what you're saying. So, where they label it at Barnes and Noble, yeah. metaphysics yeah, is metaphysics. under. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah. I know our listeners know that, but yeah. oh, that's, yeah, that's fu- I didn't even think about that. That's fine because I haven't thought about that like in a long time. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I better might well, be described better as like uh, yeah, esoteric or something like that. That's yeah. probably the yeah. better term for the cult yeah. stuff. What but. is that? Yeah. I, yeah. I just remember, I just remember because I've had a Christian background. I mean, not that I knew what metaphysics was, but I always saw that yeah. in the yeah. bookstore yeah. and. Yeah was confused but you thought yeah, witchcraft so, metaphysics is witchcraft yeah witchcraft yeah <laughs> yeah what is that so so anyways we are talking about metaphysics and so uh maybe i'll start off with a little bit of a story um about what good. it is so yeah the the term actually comes from aristotle from from mm-hmm. the book the metaphysics just means before you get to physics or for him, the science wasn't like study of physics, uh, like natural sciences. Um, yeah. Like we think today, but just all the sciences. So basically before you start talking about all these other issues in, in, um, about nature and the physical world, we need to kind of get behind it and mm-hmm. see what kinds of things we assume about the natural world or what makes it, that way what is reality and the way it's come to be is just in the ancient world is a study of why is there something rather than nothing Mm -hmm. (laughs) and yeah and um the study of being study of being yeah that's how that's how i thought about it being and non-being being Being and non-being yeah these are these are the questions yeah Sometimes synonymous with ontology, which yeah. is the study of being, yeah. Yeah, I think metaphysics and ontology are, yeah, same thing for the most part. At least in terms of 
what's being studied. It, they're yeah. they're very they're, they're, they have similar lenses, though similar similar uh, things that they're looking at. So they're kind of to me they're they're the same thing. But yeah. yeah. So it's interesting in the ancient world how this kind of gets kicked off. Uh, you know, studying what is real versus unreal, or are there different levels of reality, kind of more or less? Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, um, the different be difference between like concepts or ideas versus like actual real physical things. Yeah, so we talk about horses, but then we could also talk about like unicorns, mm -hmm. and you know, somehow it's an object of my mind, but. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's real in some sense, but it's not real like as having an occurrence, at least not that we know of in the physical world. Yeah. And yeah. Um, and, and once you once you start diving into and I, I found this myself, uh, once you start diving into the the realm of metaphysics, then you get into I think people often get stuck in the epistemological frameworks. Yeah. That how how yeah, can yeah. we know these things? And like uh, for me, and I think uh, I take a lot from Catherine Pickstock, which I shared I think a while ago. I have a few books just here to sit and just to, to if I need to reference something. Um, yeah, uh, she talks about how truth is is at first and foremost metaphysical. Yeah, it, truth is not epistemological. Like many, like our culture now, when you talk about truth, they're talking about it in the epistemological frame, from mm -hmm. the experience of the knower rather than mm -hmm. the idea of truth actually transcending the sort of uh, our our subjective frameworks um mm -hmm. and so there is a confusion in a lot of you know anytime you have these discussions about like even say like the existence of god right a lot of times we will you're using different language essentially you're speaking different languages often um now the new atheism movement is all but dead in terms of like Mm -hmm. broader academic seriousness new atheism is a doesn't have any hold any water anymore it's in any serious mm -hmm. argument in academia for the most part um yeah. there's yeah. there are respectable atheists to be sure like there are some uh but in terms of like when when you see like the reddit or twitter arguments about like you know some this the reasonable yeah, skeptic or something, right make a rock you can't move or something yeah. right and like the, the these these accounts that have these arguments about like if the universe is so big, God can't exist because of I don't really understand argument, but they fundamentally do not understand what the Christian or like the theists mean by God in what we what, how we understand who God is and his nature. Um, and so metaphysics can really help to dispel a lot of ignorance about, you know, even if you don't believe in even if you don't want to believe in God, I think you should learn at least what people who do believe in God actually think about what God is and what he isn't. Because if you just have like straw mans constantly, you can't have any, any sort of serious dialogue that you can learn anything. From. So metaphysics can really be helpful in that regard. Um, I have found mm -hmm. Absolutely. early on. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's one of those things. So when we go back and you look at the history of it, it get actually, it predates, of course, um, Aristotle, he just writes that book, which yeah, are really Plato, just a collection yeah. of notes from his students. Sure. But yeah. Yeah. So, Plato's um, kind of the, the forerunner. Plato. Most in yeah, Western. Plato, priest and Mm hmm. Priest yeah. Yeah. And actually, mm -hmm. Yep. And you can go back, really, there's a, there, a lot of people believe that um, there's kind of an Indo European religion mm -hmm. going on with hel helomorphism, the form matter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but sure. that kind of re reaches back to a discussion of being that that's influenced by Indian religion. So sure. Hindu, certain kind forms of Hinduism. Yeah. Um, that, that Vedanta, I think is a, is a, mm -hmm. uh, Hindu theist perspective, um, mm -hmm. that I've heard is has a lot of similar qualities to classical yeah. Christian you know, conceptions of God. So, uh, yeah. So a continue on your, yeah. So you have like, uh, it, you know, Thales and Anaximander, Her Heraclitus, mm -hmm. 
Empedocles and, and Plato kind of end up being, of course, the Hellenized um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> propon- proponents that really kind of focus in on on being it. But, you know, some believe that they're it's because they're interacting, especially like Thales, who's interacting with people in Egypt, people in India, people, different places. He's he's kind of, you know, he doesn't arise in a in a vacuum, you know. <laughs> Yeah, nobody, yeah, no thinker does, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, yeah. So there, there becomes this discussion of like, really, yeah, what is, what is the difference between being and non-being? Because that can kind of mm-hmm. be an interesting problem. Um, because we're when we think of non-being, you know, it's not a stuff, right? But it, at the same, at, at the same way, ontologically, it, it it negates being or, or it's corresponding to being in a real way, yeah. which is yes. really kind of bizarre. So you uh-huh. have, yeah. So that becomes a discussion real versus unreal. And so if uh-huh. non being is real, at least in some sense, at least in a, as a negation of the real or the ontological, yeah. mm-hmm. um, you have kind of an interesting thing being built up. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, true. So for, um, for some of the philosophers like, um, um, like, um, um, these early Greek Socratics or pre-Socratics, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Um, there, there becomes this kind of inner discussion about okay well wait a sec maybe there has to be something that brings or is the cause or maybe not cause in the right way but something that ontologically undergirds or transcends being and non-being yeah and so you get this interesting discussion begins to develop especially from plato Mm -hmm. aristotle and plotinus of the one yeah which Mm -hmm. it basically is 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 named the one because there's there, it's simple there's no um yeah pieces or parts to it, it it's not made up of being um right. it's somewhere that everything both yeah. being and non-being yeah. yeah 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 i mean you get the understanding plato and i think it's you know, our podcast is called discerning the forms right so yep that's yeah. a that's a platonic sort of nod to understanding Honestly. that the forms yeah. are right the eternal um, you have the things in the the world, which is part of the changing world, right? Like the world itself yep. is moving, changing, and the forms are eternal, where they don't actually change. Like these are the the highest form of, like, say, like a dog participates in the form of a dog, right? Or like, uh, mm-hmm. I don't know, a tree, right? You think of a tree, and then you have the form of the tree, which is different than what is in the what the platonic would call the shadow realm, right? Like the, mm-hmm. you know, and then you have Plato's allegory, the cave. Yeah, because you get Parmenides. Yeah, right, mm-hmm. right. So you have... Yeah, who it, kind of discusses that shadow realm, yeah. Right, yeah. So mm-hmm. so if you understand the allegory of the cave, right, you have the, the men who are enslaved, who are chained down in this cave. There's the sunlight that comes out from above. It can only, they can only see the shadows of what's moving against the cave wall. Then you have to mm-hmm. discern. This is the form. This is what they see. What we see is is the shadow, right? We're we're mm-hmm. we're enslaved in the ch- in the world that's changing, and we can't actually see what is truly real because that is an eternal truth that mm-hmm. the everything we see now participates um, in the form that is the eternal form mm-hmm. or the one we should say everything kind of and Christianity takes this up obviously, um, yeah, makes it coherent but that's a that's that's yeah. fast forwarding a lot it's fa- there's a lot of fast forwarding i just did but um <laughs> yeah that's exactly yeah so you can, yeah like you said so you you end up getting this distinction between what is uh true being which is eternal continuous mm-hmm. motionless immutable perfect immutable yeah yeah uh, exactly. versus yeah versus um being becoming and non-being so you have this kind mm-hmm. of chaos Yep. which is non-being and being which can arise from or descend into mm-hmm. the chaos 
Yeah, yeah. But what is what is creating those changes, those becomings, or those um, those disappearances, so to speak? Well, it's there's something transcending it that is that is fixed, that is eternal, that is mm-hmm. um, that that is ultimately in you know in goes beyond what we can see, and in fact, that becomes yeah. a, a big uh, discussion: is the seen and the unseen, or the hidden? Uh, mm-hmm. versus the revealed the um which we get even in the new testament language like that oh, yeah all big times yeah. god who's christ who's um made all things seen and unseen and and so yep yep um well, yeah the this, word becomes flesh right like the whole the, the the infinite and the finite sort of cohere in christ right like the yeah. the, the form and the yeah so it's the new testament's very yeah very much talking about a lot of that stuff or engaging yeah, with it. At least. Very interesting. Yeah. So you have, mm-hmm. um, yeah. So he, again, going back to this ancient perspective, um, how, yeah, you, with Plato and Aristotle, you get this discussion of the, the helomorphism form versus matter, mm-hmm. which you talked about. So you have, um, play, you know, Plato, who's a little bit, you know, sees, matter as a kind of like you were describing a shadow or a, an imperfect replication or copy yes. of forms yeah um so just to kind of help help people figure this out um you could think of matter as um the stuff that a form is made of and the form is mm-hmm. the idea for for plato it's an idea yeah. that's that's yeah. eternal and changing yeah. Yeah, it's in the mind that you can contemplate the form in through the yep. mind. This is what you has how you contemplate what is yeah, actually. And then there's various beings of like, yeah, how do we get? How yes. does our intellect um, grasp right. these things? Mm-hmm. Like you mm-hmm. gave the example of the cave. You know, he gives the analogies yep. there of like how you mm-hmm. kind of rise up to discern these forms. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah. Um, then in, in, in Aristotle, he kind of does something a little different, you know, that mm-hmm. I, I try not to be so cartoonish with Aristotle thinking that draw, you know, there's a famous painting of Plato's pointing up and Aristotle's pointing out as, right, right, as right. Aristotle's talking about, um, like substances being, being, um, more in the things themselves rather than part of right. those eternal ideas um, right um, which is an important distinction but but i but, but eventually you get disciples and students of both of these philosophers who end up um um developing um like plotinus uh neoplatonism which yeah, yeah, integrates yeah, yeah. the two so you mm-hmm. can have matter that has form, and then yeah. there's, there's the causal structure that Aristotle has the four causes. You know the material form. You know right. what it's made right. out of, the shape mm-hmm. it takes, um, um, how it was um, acted on by their potencies, and then what its end is. Its yeah. teleology. Act and potency is a good, a good, some good buzzwords to understand Aristotle, right? Yeah. This- yeah, I think those are good. Not that we need to extrapolate too much on that stuff, but I think that's a helpful way of even just, dis- I mean, you get some that's of that stuff. Way, uh, uh, metaphysics for, yeah. Right. Yeah. The idea of like, uh, every, like, uh, I don't, I'm trying, I'm not trying to bring too much theology, but I feel like theology is just like, mm-hmm. is metaphysics at the end of the day. <laughs> you almost theology. anticipate it. Yeah. It, it, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. And think about like the a classical understanding of God is like pure act, right? Like Aquinas, which I think you mentioned talking mm-hmm. about reading mm-hmm. uh so a, god is pure act mm-hmm. everything he does just is there is no potentiality in god mm-hmm. that's a way like aquinas like augustine yeah. the early church father they understood this idea of god and then we are all like the world is made of, of everything has potentiality but not mm-hmm. every potentiality comes to be right like a mm-hmm. coffee becomes mm-hmm. the water and the beans have the potential to become mm-hmm. coffee but that doesn't mean so there's mm-hmm. all that sort of yeah. Right, where you yeah it could be and it might be, be other potencies yeah. exactly right you have to, yeah there's all these other potentialities 
but God himself has no potentiality in him. He is just pure act. He, just he is, is no, yeah. there's nothing potential. He just is. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a Which way of thinking. For, yeah. For, yeah. And so for Aristotle's, he reaches up to understand the divine simplicity in, as yeah. it relates to causes, mm -hmm. kind of understands this idea of an unmoved mover, the one who, yes. Um, yeah. That's, that's the idea you're describing there where there's not, he's, there's nothing yeah. causing his internal nature, nothing that he's dependent yeah. on. Yeah. Um, but that he is the one acting and yeah, everything else is yeah. So um mm -hmm. yeah, so and then in Plotinus, they uh, Plotinus just sort of integrates them, but he creates this sort of uh structure of of higher and lower being, kind of a chain of being. Mm -hmm. which we're going to which we'll see is important for, important for later christian de development but oh yeah um so yeah with Plotinus, he has these four modes of being um which is like the one what we've been talking about um this is, is you know something that transcends all um thought and experience mm -hmm. as the one that brings both being and non-being into existence or transcends it um mm -hmm. the intellect the soul you get this kind of triadic structure going yeah. on and then mm -hmm. and then matter yeah and yeah. you can see how then um jewish and christian philosophers begin to be um hellenized so to speak by the first century so by the time jesus is is doing ministry um you already have hellenized jews oh yeah um, second temple judaism who, yeah big time yeah, um who have been a lot of that that oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Like jewish and christian thinkers yeah, kind of thinkers, thinking yeah. through this and thinking of the god of of the bible who's been revealed to us mm -hmm. in the jewish scriptures so um, you know, of course, this leads into all sorts of conversations of should ha should um, Judaism or Christianity ha should it have been Hellenized? Like, should it have adopted this language, this Platonic mm -hmm. and Neoplatonic yeah. language? Um, you know, that is kind of a debate. The, we, the strange thing that happens once you, you know, if you say no, it shouldn't have. Mm hmm certain language in the new testament becomes super unintelligible so uh, mm -hmm. for instance um yeah the book of john Colossians, oh yeah or, well, almost, gospel of john is a straight up yeah, yeah it's <laughs> yeah, it's metaphysical Jesus against paul yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh yeah yeah um mm -hmm. you know and then of course they would reject the the later um early church orthodoxy that that was reaching for you know just the highest language mm -hmm. it could to talk about god oh yeah and used um you know greek words like usia or or homo usia yeah and or, the trinitarian or, debates yeah they're using the the substance language that are yeah substance. prominent in the greek philosophy yeah yep and then Aquinas, so, Aquinas, right? Like just, just even to reference him, right? He's using yeah. Aristotle in a very explicit way, where it's like he's baptizing Aristotle, right? Yeah. The uh, philosopher, it, he calls him. <laughs> yeah, the philosopher, right? And then Augustine is certainly. I mean, you have this. These, mm -hmm. I don't want. These are very like kind of like cliche tropes, but like so you got Aquinas as Augustine, and you got or no Aquinas as Aristotle, and Augustine as the Plato of the Christian. Yeah. Right, so you gotta have yeah. that like uh, that split though, because yeah, most because of the Augustine doctors of the church, yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, most, so Origen, Augustine, mm -hmm. even the Cappadocian right. fathers, um, very the, much, yeah, Cappadocians, the, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. the authors of Christian Orthodoxy used Platonic language and and mm -hmm. Hellenism, which is this hylomorphic kind of mm -hmm. discussion. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, there's it's just kind of this way of parsing out the universe, just like um, in parsing out being in in its mm -hmm. uh, of itself in the highest way we could talk about it. Um, yeah, just like I might say, um, 
you know, your body is um, made of uh, torso, limbs, and a head, yeah. or mm -hmm. you are body and spirit, or you are, you know, those are all real. Yeah. We could argue our realities. Yes. Um, but they're just kind of different perspectives on, on looking at it. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so you get this, this kind of bringing in, which is really um, interesting. So as, you know, we talk about the divine trinity, how that gets articulated yeah. in the early church, defended. And then, of course, Christology becomes an issue because how do mm -hmm. we say this particular person, this yeah. this Jewish yeah. uh, prophet, king, messiah mm -hmm. figure, mm -hmm. how, how do we say he is God? Or at least how do we worship him if God is this, this uh, simple, right. assaic, um, being that transcends being and non being and all of yes. the modes of being, yeah. Um, and and so, of course, then you get later developments in Christology. So, so for mm -hmm. the Christian metaphysical picture that that we're being built on, it ends up just being super Neoplatonic and just, um, and and that's kind of how orthodoxy carries itself. It continues oh, yeah. to carry itself. Um, Do you have any thoughts about this? <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm... Yeah, let me... Well, let me see if there's anything else I mm -hmm. want to say about that first. Yeah, just for background. Just for background. Sure. Yeah, no, that's good. Because you get kind of... So, okay, what's kind of going on in the world of metaphysics to, in the Christian discussion of metaphysics today, you have all these... You have East and West, mm -hmm. so Greek Orthodox, Catholics, and then various Protestant yep. groups who mm -hmm. um, have developed, their traditions have developed differently, mainly because the Eastern mm -hmm. churches were Greek-speaking, Western mm -hmm. churches were Latin-speaking, but then also yeah. because of the way they used language or the way um, Aristotle was reintroduced in Thomas Aquinas, mm -hmm. there's differences. So... Um, you know, for, for instance, um, and, and then you have differences within the, the scholastic traditions as well. Thomas Aquinas versus Don Scotus and others. Um, yeah. What a lot of Christians are gravitating towards today, why I know you and I have been influenced by, um, mm -hmm. is a discussion over radical orthodoxy. So yeah, yep. Um, kind of what this means is, to kind of give you a quick, some of the listeners a quick, uh, picture of it the modern world after the enlightenment sort of tried to um rebuild itself huh? without reference to the tradition or reference to scriptures or anything else um you know descartes is famous for yeah, building everything kind of the, on the introduction the person, right? Yeah, yeah the introduction yeah. of uh, yeah the thinking cognitive yeah. being and yeah, the, so the idea of the idea of the neutrality of foundations, right? Like yeah. that somehow that society our our even our thinking selves could have a neutral ground mm -hmm. to stand on, and then yeah. we uh, then we start to yeah. bring things in. Yeah, because it's born out, out of real issues like uh, the Thirty Years' War between Protestants and Catholics, and so so can can we transcend both Protestants and Catholics and non-believers? Yeah. yeah, John like Locke as well. He, he gets into that, yeah. right? John Locke as well. Sorry, yep. yeah, John. Yeah, absolutely. He gets into that. Yeah. So, um, so this there's so what modernism tended to do is try to build on these foundations, where which it's completely different, but because Christianity, though it, though it kind of inherited a long tradition of um, different kinds of ancient philosophy and discussions and dialogues that were already going on, especially within Hel Hel Hellenism, mm -hmm. um, the Enlightenment tried to uh, find foundations it could build on, and outside of those discussions or outside of the Christian tradition and so um, eventually this leads to 
in in the orthodox radical orthodox story this leads eventually to the breakdown of modernism the critique of modernism by various kinds of thinkers who we kind of end up lumping together as postmodern mm-hmm. um which <laughs> most of them didn't think of them or didn't even like the word postmodern but <laughs> Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's such a. It might be an unhelpful. I've always thought of it as a very unhelpful yeah. category, just of parsing yeah. out things, because then you kind of put these things in boxes, and it's like, well, and uh, James K. Smith, who is also yeah. kind of part of radical orthodoxy, talks yeah. about how actually very modern. So many of the postmodern thinkers actually are, at the end of the day, that they're not actually like post. Yeah. They're still deeply modern. They're just like. Offering up critiques of certain forms of of enlightenment modernism that that they see yeah. as problematic. Yeah, so you could yeah. say like Marx is still he's inverting, let's say Hegel. Yeah. So you get eventually, mm-hmm. um, you know, you get this division between rationalism and mm-hmm. um, and empiricism. And mm-hmm. you have Kant who come comes in and tries to basically save science by building those back together, but he brings yeah. it into more imminent cognitive uh-huh. yeah. uh view. So a priori abstract objects, ideas, and concepts, instead of them being forms that are real out there, mm-hmm. are now objects of consciousness. Yes. And um, then you have kind of science, you have experiences that are interpreted and sort of formed or shaped mm-hmm. become the, the jars that hold the the ideas that help you do science or help you experience experience the world perceptions and so forth. Yeah, Kant um, is a very ske- I, sketchy reconstruction. Yeah, Kant, Kant enslaves us to the, to the epistemological. Yes. He, 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 when, and I did a a paper on sort of the the history of sort of modern theology and how it's threaded. Kant is like a major figure who like Kant and Hegel are are major figures in in how understanding mo- where modern theology has ended up and how mm-hmm. people have responded to it. Right, like sort of you know Hegel, like say like you said Hegel and Marx, right? Like Marx mm-hmm. thinks that history has no metaphysical quality to it. Mm-hmm. And Hegel thinks only it has only a metaphysical quality to it that only being is in becoming, right? Like the idea of yeah. of history is is being becoming yeah. being, and Marx is yeah, for him still immanentist in the sense that it doesn't yes. have a real transcendence. No, 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 no. So, but we're but there's kind of a zeitgeist of human consciousness, mm-hmm. co- collective consciousness, going through all these processes of of um, um nuanced argument and other nuanced counter, counter arguments and yeah and bringing those things together to build to kind of stair step up you know, it's the whole the whole ai consciousness thing that if we just put in enough um mm-hmm. you know inputs and and algorithms and structures eventually the 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 thing will have sentience and yeah um <laughs> or we we reach these higher levels kind of that way but yeah yeah, and then Marx, it's really just, again, but it's all shifting foundations. So the foundation, mm-hmm. you know, for um, then Marx is is economics, you know. Well, not every right. life is in a struggle between reason, but it, but but people care about how to put food in the table. And so right. and it's, it's the class the struggle, right? It's the, yeah. right, it's the class yeah. struggle between the, bourgeois, the bourgeoisie and the, yeah. Yeah, the proletariat. That's that's his that's his almost actually I would say his metaphysical framework for understanding the world is through the lens the of the bourgeoisie and, the, and yeah the class the class war Violent, it, yeah yeah I think um, David Bentley Hart uh, and maybe we'll get to some of this stuff later but he is he has a really good point about um, the way in which the escape from metaphysics is just an escape to another metaphysics like there is literally no escape. There is no escaping. You cannot escape it. This is the yeah. bigger point. And, <laughs> it's inescapable. And what, yeah, and what postmodernism tried to do. Yes. Was yeah. You, it, it, it almost kind of embraces this kind of undergirding kind of violent ontology in the sense that it wants to mm-hmm. critique all of it, but it kind of um, 
it lapses into a ontology of violence and only deconstructs only takes down only breaks down everything ma mainly in modernism and that's obviously a rough, rough scratch, sketch that's not what everybody's trying to do um so called right yeah we're we're given just kind of like ballpark notions ballpark here stuff. right yeah that we're, yeah. Not, we're not yeah but some stuff we'll get i think we should dig down a little more into but you're right like the if anybody considers postmodern, it's because they are critiquing modern structures of, say, like epistemology, yep. right? Like the idea of way to know, yeah, foundationalism, post-structuralism, all these sort of yeah. buzzwords yeah. that um, that are at the end of the day, if you're if you're wading through this kind of stuff, like if you're a Christian, um, I mean, we'll have answers. I'll probably have some answers for that, but some of that stuff is not worth reading. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just be yeah, I'll just be completely like some stuff is some stuff is really like there are thinkers you have to mm -hmm. engage with in a real way, but yeah. there's some of it to me that I find tedious and I'm like I just don't even agree with this fundamentally. So mm -hmm. I, I don't often I don't want to waste my time necess unnecessarily, but um, but it depends on what's going on and how I'm experiencing the world and mm -hmm. if I run into something I need to like read that and then so it's. Yeah. It, it probably yeah, you get these various. It's interesting you get these various hangovers too yeah. after modernism and then into this postmodern realm, mm -hmm. both from um, analytic and continental philosophy, where yeah, uh, stuff just breaks down and you end up running into the same problems the pre-Socratics had, like how, what's the difference between one and many? Are there other minds? Are there, yeah. you know all the other kind of second-order ontology? Yeah, discussions get brought right back in, and then you mm -hmm. even have like in the analytic tradition a revival of metaphysics through Saul Kripke, and then mm -hmm. multi worlds hypothesis to to right, discover right. universals. Which yeah. was funny because even to have that discussion, you have to know what universals are. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean that it could yeah. be through in all possible worlds. So it's yeah. got the cart before the horse. Yeah, I analytic yeah, analytic method. philosophy is a just to me it's just a straight up bummer, but I'm sure we both agree <laughs> at some level on that. <laughs> I don't know, like yeah. not that there isn't stuff to be gained from it, but I at least my engagement with it in recent eight, eight times is like I, I it does nothing for me in ways of that's anything that's truly interesting. Um yeah. especially for the human experience, you know. Yeah. Um it doesn't have the language to to really plumb the depths of what's going on in our internal lives, right? Like we have, yeah. it, and there's ways. Like we had, we had a guy, um, it's like Austin, who we is it Austin, who we had on our pod, podcast, yeah, we discussed like Wittgenstein, but see, yes. Wittgenstein, like he broke down into this strange place that was almost like, yeah, Heidegger. I mean, so there, there's yes. a, it, it they. And I think what ends up happening with um, analytic ph philosophy is, you know, it started out trying to be very positivistic and solve everything through language and yeah, it kind of it kind of flows from through language and yeah and logic yeah. and getting yeah. behind that of and in using like set theory yeah. and so forth, but mm -hmm. but um, eventually it ends up lapsing back into a meta needing to discuss a metaphysics. Yeah, and but there's interesting things that happen in language philosophy, and that's both in the you know, like for instance, um, um, oh, who was it that did the had the um, speech act theory? Uh, I can't think of him. Um, but speech it act theory would it wasn't Polanyi. It wasn't Polanyi, right? No, that's no, that's, um, no. Polanyi uh, kind of comes from a different angle, but he's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. As, as some, um, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so you have speech act theory that kind of discusses like what we're doing. This again, this is a kind of evolving from Wittgenstein of like if language is use, what are we doing with language? And there's not oh, just certain propositional Searle. language. Uh, Sorry. You know, and then right? Searle, Searle, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you get this what Richard Rorty calls a linguistic and interpretive turn in philosophy that kind of is where postmodernism kind of emer you know emerges as a total critique mm -hmm. of of modernism 
And radical orthodoxy wants to say, well, okay, that, that that's good as a critique, and there's a lot we can use mm-hmm. there. There's a lot, lot of things to salvage there. Yeah. Um, and so it just wants to come back and say, yeah. okay, but yeah. let's just get, but we can't continue freedom after all this deconstruction. We have the freedom to yeah. continue back on the trail of me- metaphysics that we yeah. were on. Maybe mm-hmm. maybe go back and critique some some scholastic and medieval thinkers that maybe caused the train to derail. So usually, yeah. John Scotus is a yeah. He's the favorite. he's the yeah. prime <laughs> he's the prime target for the radical orthodoxy for sure because he believed uh, in university instead of yeah. understanding language of God as an analogy like Aquinas right. did. Yes, um, he, he, he wanted language to be a one to one. Yeah, right. He wants one to one language between the. Yeah, yeah. He collapses. Like you know, we're talking about being a non being, and he mm-hmm. collapses God, God into into the realm of being as like yes. just the biggest fish yeah. in the ocean. And so, and this right. is where we get atheism. Most most atheism, for sure. Yep, is critiquing often pictures or ideas mm-hmm. of God that they have. That are still think you know why does um you know god seems you know um what like angry and selfish and hedonistic okay well wait mm-hmm. a second it's because you brought you know you're taking like certain biblical language for instance and you brought that into this chain of being and right you see god is just yeah. a big zeus yeah know, he's just poor yeah he has yeah. that he has any creative property at all yeah. That he actually, you know, like the idea that, like, you know, the way that I've I've thought about it is that, you know, God is not another tree. He's not like a tree or another object within the created sphere, right? He's he mm-hmm. his God's existence it transcends the binary between being and non being. It transcends that because God doesn't actually have being, right? We we've mentioned that before. Everything has being from God, but this is the sort of a lot of the radical orthodoxy is trying to recover a more participatory understanding of meta- yeah. ontology, right? Like that yeah. we, the world participates in God's being, right. And it receives all of its being as a gift from God, who is yeah. the, tri- you know, the triune, but that's a bit. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, that's good. That's where it goes. And so that, that's what drives a lot of us back into the tradition. So for instance, yeah. Um, now you could go back and that whole story I was talking about with this Neoplatonism, mm-hmm. uh, eventually you get really interesting figures like um, Maximus the Confessor. Oh, yeah. Who, who tries, yeah. Who, who answers very creatively and interestingly, um, in yeah. incarnational, um, you know, resolve to Neoplatonism. Mm-hmm. Like it, like it, yeah. Um, he create he has a division between the uncreated nature God and the created nature. Then uh, created nature is divided into the intelligible universe and the sensible universe. Yeah, the sensible universe is divided into heaven and earth. Earth is divided mm-hmm. into inhabited earth and paradise. Human yeah. is divided into male and female. Um, mm-hmm. and, but you know, eventually you get to be this incarnational thing where God, um, and then here's what i've been excited about uh is the um the irish theologian 800s 877 or somewhere around there hmm. on scotus erigena hmm. um he is a very he was ahead of his time in a lot of ways but he took maximus confess the confessor and kind of um, took that ontology chain of being that mm-hmm. you get from pseudo Dionysius, but but here you have an act of God um, acting in this this chain of being, mm-hmm. but as he creates, he he creates a world that at, um, in his creation account he calls good. You know, in the seven days or in the seven days of creation. Mm-hmm. Uh, mirrors of himself in participation. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. The idea of yeah, there's an ascent of creation up to God yes. in participation. Yes. Yep. And you can even understand, you know, this is where we had that um we had that podcast on Everhard Jungle 
you know, where where God dies, where he descends mm-hmm. to the depths of chaos and resurrects it back up. However, yeah, yeah, yeah. Charles yeah. talks about it better than I can. But, uh, that dude is, that dude, Charles yeah. is densely brilliant for sure. Yeah. So, yeah. The, so there's just, we can, we continue, we just continue to draw on this language just because it's the highest thing we have. And eventually our knowledge, our language, our thoughts break down. Mm-hmm. And it goes, yeah. So then, um, you know, the, the other, the other thing you could get into, cause we've had Roy Clouser on, mm-hmm. you know, and he, he brings in a lot of the Eastern tradition, um, Palom, the Palomite distinction between mm-hmm. essence and energies and so forth. Um, there, there, there's the Eastern church kind of, um, you know, we talked about God transcending being non-being. So Sergei yeah. Bulgakov and others that, um, right. Bring in this idea of God, of God, um, and, and they reach back. The, some of these Russian Orthodox theologians in in the uh, 1950s, 60s, that kind of thing, is they're uh, <laughs> fleeing the USSR <laughs> or fleeing yeah. the USSR, um, yeah. are interacting with theologians and realizing, oh, wait a second, um, we're different than than this Thomism stuff. We have yes. this Palamite distinction that says. Mm. The reason why the analogies God break down at a certain point in his simplicity and in, or in his aseity and simplicity is yeah. that um, um, the 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 language and the encounters and the sort of in time um, and and space dis, you know ways that we have to talk about God mm-hmm. break down and we can't know God in His essence. That's a right. mystery. Going back. Cappadocian fathers, but yes, um, yeah. we know him in his energies, the way he's acted yeah. as a single act. Right. Um, well, in the East, yeah, I was going to say the East, the Eastern search has an understanding of theosis, right? Becoming divine. And a yeah. lot of people tend to, when they hear this language, which is actually in, I think it's first or second Peter. When he talks about partaking of the divine nature, he literally, this is literally in the New Testament. This isn't like some later development, right? This is New Testament language, but um, the, the, the East understands the their understanding of sanctification uh, and mm-hmm. theosis as we, we are participate in God's energies. We can never encounter him in his essence because that's not what free, creatures cannot do that. We cannot become god in that sense but like god in terms of his energies so those yeah. that's a good way of understanding the what's going on there with the eastern yeah. sanctification process of becoming yeah yeah, yeah. so then then you kind of get into then just to to take us a little further along this kind of christian way of thinking about metaphysics mm-hmm. um after Karl bart you get this idea of a revisionary metaphysics this mm-hmm. need to maybe revise metaphysics to actually um, bring it as close as you can. Uh, this is a bad way of speaking, maybe, but at least bring as close yeah. as you can to a, to a Trinitarian mm-hmm. metaphysics. Like we need a Trinitarian ontology, mm-hmm. and we need it to really match Scripture and the Word of God, the revelation of God, as much as we can. So yeah, you have people trying to do re- revisionary metaphysics, and here I'm not talking about like process philosophy. Or, that's a whole nother no trajectory. No, that's a, but that's different. Yeah, but people like I, Robert Jensen um, mm-hmm. and others who propose maybe dropping the yeah. idea of simplicity, but keeping or in the ways yeah. we think about a deity, um, right? Not because he doesn't believe God is simple necessarily. I mean, maybe somebody mm-hmm. can talk about that, but because. Yeah. Um, yeah, the there's some, there's some, comes, yeah, no, I was gonna say there's some, there's, some, I mean, Bart is troubling for a lot of reasons. Uh, his Kantian <laughs> sort of framework is he never escapes that. He, Bart never gets yeah. out of the modern Kantian noose, you know, mm-hmm. distinction between the, yeah. So to me, like Bart, I, mm-hmm. not, this is gonna go, uh, I'm not gonna go on a long rant about my critique of Bart, but, um, but there certainly is to me, and I'm I guess I'm just an unabashed like Christian Platonist, so like I'm like, Yeah, why why we need to do that? But I you know, I get it, like there's some sense in which like modern theology became deeply problematic in Bart's time. I mean, he's really responding to some pretty bad stuff, right? So 
Bart is a conservative in his time, even though nowadays I think he's more closer, if we're going to use those those distinctions, mm-hmm. like a liberal, more or yeah, less. Still, in terms of his, still some yeah. modernism left there. Yeah. There's a lot of and Bart. There's a lot of modernism, right? He re, he re, he, he does he it. does. A, yeah. yeah, he's trying to escape it, but at the same time, he is he is entrapped in the epistemological framework that modernism offers. Yeah. That he wants to he wants to his suspicion of, and this is a problem. I think it, just to go back to your comments about the accept should we have accepted the Hellenization right mm-hmm. of Christian, yep. and it's like. I that's think yes, yeah. That's the question. So I think yes, and Bart would say we should reject a majority. Yeah, of he wants to it, radically, yeah. yeah, start with scripture and build up, which yeah, is a good which, project. Which but, is not. I don't. I love scripture. We we all the stuff we need to get it. We need to get it from scripture, right? But there's a way in which his project is is deeply problematic because of his philosophical. Revelation, maybe even right? scripture is not the right way. It's. It's Christ. Oh yeah. Christ, well, Christ is the, the is the first word, right? And then you have the second word, which is scripture. Yeah. Because so he is the, the, the emanation. The, is the, yeah. So, so there you go. But then even Bart in his yeah. Trinitarian yeah. theology. Window, see, now, we're go to, yeah. now, now we're going to go. Now we're going to go. Now we're going to go to critique Bart. Like, he, get, he, yeah, I won't go down well, that rabbit hole. But yeah. No, but they, no, but Bart gets into some modalistic tendencies, and so there's there's all sorts yeah. of problems. But yeah. Bart, for, for a lot of what I love a lot of what he does, he has very beautiful yeah, sort of theology and incarnational understanding of, of Christ. And um, But in terms of his acceptance of tradition, that's why I would say you should, people should read C.F. Torrance or somebody mm-hmm. in that well, yeah. who's, who is a Bardian, but whole, but very much accepts the Greek yeah. tradition and the, the, the understanding of like participation. Yeah. And, um, he, he does... He takes Bart, the things that are good in Bart, but then he embodies a more traditional framework, which I wholesale much more appreciate, <laughs> and I think is better yeah. than than yeah, Bart. Absolutely. But let, we'll yeah, move on. Or from, even Robert Jensen, who brings it out. Yeah, Jensen also yeah. is is pretty. Jensen also is, is better than Bart in a lot of ways, not because he's um, Lutheran, um, which I, I I I appreciate that, but. Um, mm-hmm. So there, there's a lot of this in the metaphysical discussions. Mm-hmm. There's there, there's so many directions you can go with learning yeah. and the way things developed. And only reading modern texts is I would you would probably also say is probably a really bad idea. That you yeah, kind of have I, to start, absolutely yeah. You have to start with with the pre Socratics with Plato with Aristotle. You, know, you really got to engage some of that stuff in a in a deeper way to start mm-hmm. to make sense of. Because, because even like you said, like you, a lot of these these things are always reoccurring. Like there isn't, nobody's really moved on from that time. I think Heidegger wanted to move on. Heidegger wanted to be like, we need to start, you know, we need to move on from the Greek met because it's all been sort of the same discussion. Um, yeah, and there's people like Henry Bergson and then um, mm-hmm. Deleuze, but yeah, you still can wind up. They they have an imminentist ontology yeah. that still demands a transcendence always so you, so yeah. Interesting. yeah and so, even the yeah yeah so um yeah then i think there's an interesting thing is we're still on the uh, thinking about christian metaphysics there and we've had roy clauser on um he's an advocate of herman doivard's uh, philosophy basically he's just an ontologist as well in fact he almost has nothing on epistemology and he he was right. trying to get away from that and because he presupposes meaning, there's interesting things going on there, but um, he believes that all what creates these kind of staying ontologies within um, these different eras, and, and he believes that there's what, what he calls a ground, ground motive that underlies um, the different kind of parsing of ontology. So, yeah. Um, he he gives he says basically whatever your ground motive is is his language um, defines what most fundamentally occupies the discourse of thinkers society over a long period it defines how the how problem or how evil is conceived of or a problem Mm -hmm. it defines what society aspires to um you know what what's the solution or 
or whatever, and it defines the direction in society and how it looks. So he talks about, you know, there's the helomorphic uh, matter form, and it, the tendency that you can get into when you parse it reality in that way is you'll because of the problem of evil you'll start to say some things are good some things are bad and mm -hmm. for Doiver, this is how we eventually get something like gnosticism or something yeah. like sex is bad well because mm -hmm. um like you know origin who cut his nads off because right <laughs> right <laughs> but uh yep. it, the idea is that once you put even this in a christian framework you tend to um parse these things out and it creates a dualism mm -hmm. and so what doiverd was trying to do is get beyond or get underneath or or go beyond dualisms or dichotomies mm -hmm. to find a better way to frame metaphysics that's not mm -hmm. not reducing things down to like one or two things um right you know so then he talks about um, what he believes the the Hebraic worldview is creation, fall, redemption. It's mm -hmm. got this narrative that comes mm -hmm. from God as meaning, as the word, as creator. And that underlies the metaphysics. And so when, when he looks at someone like Thomas Aquinas, he says Thomas Aquinas integrates helomorphism and Aristotle into the christian system but his ground motive is mm -hmm. still creation fall redemption which is what salvages mm -hmm. it or what saves it or preserves it to right. some extent and yeah uh, so he he's kind of interested in like saying can we go a step deeper about yeah. the nature of reality and not mm -hmm. just talk about being but talk about meaning and right so um now then then there's different uh, ways you could do that but his suggestion is just to just to kind of say there's a whole set or a whole bunch of just a, different theories or modalities but we don't have any obligation to reduce them down to mm -hmm. each other we don't have to reduce things down to form and matter or down to mm -hmm. um, uh, determinism and freedom which he thinks is the modern problem is a problem oh, yeah. between determinism so westworld you know uh yeah, are we sure. determined are right. we free to make a free choice right yeah existential? well i yeah. yeah i think the um i think well i think christianity is the is is the way of recover is rescuing from yes. all the problems that platonism and these things like actually have i think at the end of the day in in its in its form before christianity um, there's a lot of problems there, but Christianity itself is the, the, the incarnation in particular is the way in which these things are rescued and filtered out and make, made coherent. Um, and, but without, without Christianity, I think everything devolves into, well, I mean, yeah. people have been taught a bad Christianity in a lot of ways over the past century that yeah. a lot of protestant is a lot of what is considered protestant isn't really protestant in its traditional sense um and so this idea of the deter are we determined are we free it's like i don't think you get any of that like weird dichotomy in especially in early christianity in early theology about the way we understand our 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 action in the world and the way that god moves yeah. things and um and I think David Bentley Hart has some pretty good uh, critiques of modern theology in the way he talks about it, it's either God determined or you know not, and the way in which so much of theology uh, is poisoned by this idea that God is just the determining God, right? Like mm -hmm. say like the Calvinist or like the um, right. the sort of neo Calvinist vision of God just like determines everything from the from every iota, everything is just moved because God has moved it that way. And there's this like weird shadowy understanding of like, you know, say like guys like John MacArthur or um, who say that, you know, God's glory is manifested in suffering and whatever it is in terms of like um, that God needs some sort of 
needs something to be glorified. Like he needs to have his justice and his righteousness made shown forth, or he else he won't have glory. So you get so there's this weird there are these weird angles of Christianity that 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 basically bail on traditional understandings of of freedom and of of God's action. And we we think of freedom as volitional or like just the ability to choose without on be, without being hindered by outside forces yeah. but like it's a very low view of freedom mm-hmm. um it's a very misunderstand i think it's a very misunderstood and uh, not misunderstood it, it misunderstands what true freedom actually is and we can get very christological about how we understand what freedom is right like the yeah. the that you that the, that freedom is about doing the good and whatever it isn't about freedom of choice. It's about learning what the good is and doing it. Um, yeah. Which yeah. means that you actually reduce your choice. But so not to get, not to reduce this too much, but, um, but I do think that, that Christianity is uh, the, the way it is the way to escape so much of the problems of philosophical discourse, right? Like theology yeah. needs to become, and this is sort of the radical orthodoxy position, right? Like, the theology is actually the queen of the sciences and we have we have put it in a corner and then we want to think that we can have any real actual say in the discourse of the world when it's been the public sphere is neutral but like religion and stuff like that's a private matter uh so in that and that works out culturally and you can see it in our movies you can see it in you know contemporary issues where Mm -hmm. there's a desire for transcendence and a desire for religion a desire yeah you know um and these become manifested in yeah. marvel movies or <laughs> yeah. justice movements politically yeah. right like that's I, the way I'm that people favorite yeah. thing, thing to think about it with this right now is like uh west world mm-hmm. the newer series if you can skip the sex parts my i watched it with my wife so she made me skip the sex parts no the first uh, season <laughs> i thought the first season was pretty good I never watched it beyond that. Um, yeah, it's good. It's a it, 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 it just discuss it, It's the whole issue of of AI and World mm-hmm. Economic Forum and determinism, technocracy, and then yeah, yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. That we're dealing with, but uh, but yeah, I think that uh, totally. Um, yeah, so this reorient and yeah, I think um, there's a sense of where, where Christianity and see they didn't have the same kind of brain in the vat kind of problems. No, um, yeah, they had a different, they had a whole different constellation yeah. in the universe. Right? They they understood the heavens very different. There's a pre the pre modern cosmology is very different. It, it's very it's much more beautiful. I, I'm with like Lewis, C.S. Lewis and Tolkien, where it's like that's the kind of universe I want to be inhabiting, not this like so what, Newtonian, so someone, yeah, yeah. alien world. Yeah, so whether someone, I think Christianity just generally preserves at least the 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 desire that neoplatonism christian neoplatonism did which christianity brought in the incarnation um and resolved neoplatonism it brought a resolve to it the desire that it has which is non-reductivism and Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. and non not reducing things to the imminent world of experience or imminent yes um kind of or kind of a cognitive thing yes get to different things or scientism or something like that because um, mm-hmm. all those things have been exhausted they're all exhausted and and busted apart L- lead to nowhere yeah yeah they lead to nowhere and they and in fact they're we're at a place where uh metaphysics is people are realizing more and more that metaphysics is part of it you even have someone like was it the philosopher blackburn who mm tries to come up with a whole kind of ethics that's as close to realism as he can mm-hmm. while still being in this sort of materialistic. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, a, I mean, to me, it's just that stuff is junk, <laughs> it, which is why it's... I've, I've been more interested in Christianity and the Christian traditions. Yeah. And then whatever these other, mm-hmm. these other things can say a little bit and they're interesting. You can kind of, kind of, like for yeah. instance analytic philosophy you can gain tools of analysis that then you can then use and there's a whole yeah. analytic theology thing going on mm-hmm. yeah i i tried getting into the like yeah. oliver Christ, you mean like the yeah, stuff like oliver, oliver Christ, Christ is doing yeah. right yeah i tried getting into that 
Yeah. Was it William Abraham it, and the others? Yeah. yeah, I I find myself not in love with it. Do you know <laughs> what I mean? Like I'm not. There's nothing We're that, more that the David Bentley Hart world. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm way more. <laughs> I would say like my beauty is like my my main, and he's he obviously he's a big he's a big contributor to my orientation but like even, there's other like theologians that i love right um uh that or, or or just any sort of theology that embodies this sense of wonder um and that this idea you know for heart it's like i mean i've, I've heard him say once that like there's an article i forget where it was published exactly but he talks about how like you know a delusion of fairies is better than materialist it's better to be have delusion than to be, be a materialist yeah, because what 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 yeah. what's in it for the materialist at any point? It's better to be under the spell illusion. Yeah, at least in that world, there's 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 some sort of delight that yeah. that, that that is is for its own sake. Mm -hmm. But for the materialist, there is no such thing as something for its own sake, right? Like at the end of the day, there at the bottom of everything is nothing. So you, there is no real genuine enjoyment. So for me, like. If I'm going to read like theology, if I'm going to do anything, if I'm going to read anything that's worthwhile, there has to be that mm -hmm. sense of like understanding like the deep mystery of reality. Even though you're Christian, there still is like this deep mystery that you're always that's that's never the well is never dry. That when we're studying, if we're studying God, right? God is not an object for our study, right? Like we're we are being beholden by Him in the Spirit and in the Scriptures, right? Like so, for us. It's more about learning how to listen and to recognize than it is about to control and to make um, make him an object for me to figure out. Because a lot of times for me, analytic theology and philosophy are about figuring things out. And at the end of the day, I don't think that's what we're supposed to be doing in any real stretch. I think it's cool to reason. And I think it's really good to have frameworks and be able to pick out arguments and be critical. But sure. absolutely. But, but at some point, you 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 lose any sort of 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 yeah. of, uh, of wonder and yeah. Some, there's there's a role for assertive language, of course, but of that's course. not the only um, mode we operate in. In fact, that that's why I'm so into Rene Girard. Is it, yeah, it, yeah, it's Girard's primordial great. mimetic mm -hmm. desire is primordial in his, in his yeah. anthropology. Um, yeah, so it kind of gets behind reason and and yeah. rationalize outside but i, I want to be enraptured in ecstasy by my encounter with god right like, i don't want to be this like oh, i got this i figured this out i can go argue with the atheist and i can right i don't, frankly don't care what any what any of that stuff says anymore because to me it's like it's a moot point at best if you want to talk about like why somebody shouldn't believe it's like but but who cares people are people are living their life and they're they're encountering things that which I think actually the subjective experience is very, very real and very, um, very much worth arguing for, you know, like Catherine Pickstock, who I've mentioned before, her whole book on the aspects of truth is this recovery of a kicker guardian subjectivism, which is about, you know, things are real, but they're real because, you know, the incarnation and the sort of paradox and it's it's this recovery of the of the human experience of God and of the world and of, of all the sorts of things that the empiricists the the the, the skeptics the the postmodernists if you want to call them um, all want to just reject is like well it's just your context you know if you weren't in this context you would you wouldn't be a Christian and it's like well okay but we are so there's <laughs> even if you want to hypothetically put people on spaces like there's still they are who they are, and that matters. That's actually doesn't make it less true. It makes it maybe sometimes even more true right. that context can. So for me, it's like uh, e even studying metaphysics, right? Like I want to be, I, I just want to be raptured by God. I don't. I, I want to be. I want to be really feeling the depths of of like when I'm reading something about God. I want to almost be in tears, mm -hmm. and that's a high bar for theology in general, but. Um, so that's why, for me, like metaphysics matters. It's probably the most important thing we should be caring about. If we're going to talk about philosophical discourse, metaphysics is the most important thing. Um, yeah. So absolutely, I agree. Well, thanks for listening to Discerning the Forms. We would love we love your comments and um, email and conversation. 
and shares and likes. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time on Discerning the Forms. Peace.